Uh, so like I said, Rob Parks here, Dr. Parks is uh, faculty here at the university. Um, he also runs the observatory here, and I'm told if the weather holds, maybe we can go up to the, see the telescope tonight. Tonight, yeah. Uh, so, uh, and I like that. So they have a 32-inch telescope on the roof of the building next to us, and so hopefully we can run up there uh, and take a look after our meeting. Uh, but back to Rob. Rob's a graduate. He's a Gator, graduate of the University of Florida. Uh, worked some at Emory University, I believe, and uh, and then went off and got his PhD um, six, seven years ago, 2014. 2014. Yeah. So very cool. And now he's uh, he's a, a faculty here, deputy director of the observatory that we might see later. So. I recognize Rob as being everything we need here at, at GMU. He he makes N Novak uh, work here. Um, we wouldn't have a place to be tonight, or we wouldn't have the partnership we have with the university if it weren't for Rob. So I uh, appreciate that very much, and uh, um, I'll turn it over to you for the, the, real, the real talk. I entitled this talk, Star is Born, but really, I did that because I like pop culture references. What I'm going to really be talking about is not just the beginnings of the star, but in the context of exoplanets. I think that anyone, any astronomer who tells you that they're not in this at least partially because they were looking for aliens is lying to you or trying to sell you something. Um, I know that one of my earliest motivations for research was, in fact, exoplanets, but I actually moved into looking at the next best thing, which is the young star. Because as it's been pointed out to anyone who studies exoplanets, in order to fully understand the exoplanet, you really need to know the, about the star that it orbits. Our precision of knowledge for the planets that we have found is uh, contingent on the precision of the stars that host them. And so having a good understanding of how these stars are born, how these stars are formed, is, is really essential if we want to look at how the exoplanets form and eventually, potentially, how maybe life would form. This is a talk I gave uh, last, well, September 19th, for Evening of the Stars. I will be giving the next Evening of the Stars talk, which will be on Halloween. Uh, I, will be, I will be talking about the galaxy of horrors, including some, some exoplanets. So I will be decked out. We're going to kind of make a thing. There will be candy, punch and pie, that sort of thing. So what, are, what about exoplanets? Well, the first thing that when we look at young stars, for example, one of the questions that we have is obviously, what are they? How do they form? And ultimately, how do they give us this? And to answer those questions, astronomers need benchmarks. They need boundary conditions. Essentially, they need to know what things need, uh, the model absolutely needs to take into account if it is to be anywhere close to being accurate or a uh, viable description of reality. When we look at our solar system, for a very long time, we had a data point of exactly one, our solar system. Just roughly speaking, we can already start seeing trends. We can see that for the inner planets, we have small, rocky bodies. The outer planets, we have Jupiter, Saturn, gaseous bodies that are significantly larger. They have ring systems. They have large moons, so forth and so on. There's Pluto, which is still a planet over here, which is an icy body. But uh, I get ahead of my That's another topic entirely. Uh, we also find these asteroid belts, These essentially these pieces of of, I hesitate to call them debris, but they are uh, small bodies that are both rocky and icy, so rocky bodies here, icy bodies here, and uh, the planetary systems are all well behaved. They orbit around in the same direction, their inclinations to the Earth's orbit are pretty much the same, um, pretty much circular, so everything that we have to describe how the universe came, or you, how the solar system came into being, those are some of our benchmarks. Until 1995, we had a pretty good idea of how we got, how this comes into being, uh, essentially what environment around the star there needs to be in order for this to happen, until 
1995, uh, through a giant monkey wrench. It was very exciting, as with many, many ex uh, discoveries in science, it was exciting because it was completely unexpected. So in 1995, and I'm, I, I am butchering, I'm not going to butcher the first uh, author's name, and Mayor, um, they found a planet now that, that is now known as 51 Pegasi B, meaning that it is in the constellation of Pegasus. It is the 51st, 51st star to be variable with time. And the little b indicates it's a planet. It's the first planet that was discovered around that object. Why they didn't go with little a, uh, I don't know. The thing that was uh, extraordinary about this discovery is that it's around a solar type star, a star very similar to the sun. But the planet involved is a now known as a hot Jupiter. It has the mass of one half that of, the, of Jupiter, but its orbital period is four days. That means that it is 10 times closer to its host star than Mercury is. So yes, it is. And actually there was quite a lot of specification, a lot of argument as to whether or not a temp, so the surface temperature of this thing is roughly around 1500 Kelvin, which is basically the, um, the destruction point of any kind of solid material. So the idea that it can actually be a gaseous body was highly, uh, was highly contested until finally the data became um, strong enough that we do now believe that this is in fact a Jupiter-type planet. Uh, and now we have found a lot of them. This, the 51 Pegasi B is uh, not alone anymore. It is actually one of a large group of hot Jupiters. When it comes to figuring out how this formed, we had no idea. And actually, as a point of trivia, does anyone know what the first planet was discovered, or rather the, the host star that the host, this planet orbited around. This would be the first exoplanet discovered and confirmed. <laughs> was a pulsar. Correct, yeah. So the first planet to actually be discovered was in fact Earth-sized. So the fa uh, first exoplanet we ever discovered was the size of the Earth. And it was probably even more startling than this discovery in that it was discovered in 1992 and it was discovered by someone was looking at a pulsar doing something that pulsar astronomers like to do i'm not sure what um they were looking at it and pulsars are a cosmic clock they they rotate very very quickly and very very regularly so what they found was this clock was off sometimes it was fast sometimes it was slow and the only, or the best explanation that fit was that there was a small gravitational body causing it to be perturbed, ca causing it to sometimes be coming towards us, sometimes going away from us. And the body that fit was in fact an Earth-sized planet. And they've discovered since then a couple of comets going, or, or cometary type bodies. Uh, those have been now called zombie worlds, which I will be going over in the Galaxy of Horrors. Because it's the idea is where did that planet come from? Is it a planet? So a pulsar, just to back up, a pulsar is the stellar corpse of an intermediate-sized planet or intermediate-sized star. It has gone through its life, exploded into a supernova, and pulsar is what was left behind. Now the question is: Is this planet somehow a remnant of the initial solar system? Or did it actually form from the material that got blown up? That's still very much an open question. Stuff gets even weirder. When we look at these planets, I will say with the caveat that our understanding of these planets is based on two things, mass and radius. So we know the density of these objects. And from that, we can start to infer what properties they might have. So we have found planets that are lava, that essentially are lava almost all the way through. We have found that Kevin Costner may have been onto something because there are planets that are almost all water all the way through. But the one that's probably the most provocative and found by a friend of mine um, is 55 Cancri E, which has a density which would highly imply that the interior is made out of diamonds. That the, the density or the density is that of carbon, 
but the pressures involved would actually form that uh, carbon into diamonds. So is this real? Don't know. We need more data. We need more sophisticated techniques to find it. My overall, oh, and I know plots, please stay awake. Um, what these plots are trying to demonstrate here is this is density versus radius. You have period versus eccentricity. The take home point of these plots is that the stellar systems that we have found are nothing like our own. They are, uh, they have planets that don't exist in our solar system. They have planets that shouldn't be where they, uh, they are being observed according to our old uh, theory. You have, theory, uh, you have planets that are highly eccentric, like comet-like, uh, comet-like orbits, things of that nature. So it's a, basically a wild, wild west. We have enough data at this point, as I like to say to people, if you look up in the sky, every star you see in the uh, night sky either has or has had a planet, or rather planets, going around it. Planets are a natural phenomenon of, or natural extension of star formation. If you form a star, there is no expectation that it will not form planets as well. So exoplanets, all over the place. We have 100 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy, conservatively. Even if all of them only have one planet, which is probably unlikely, it's 100 billion, star, 100 billion planets out there that are not us. Which, when people first thought that, they were like, wow, okay, yay, lots of planets, maybe lots of life. But as it turns out, um, kind of going back against the Copernican principle, we are actually kind of rare. The idea of, or the evidence so far has suggested that planetary systems, like our own, are about on the order of 46%. So of those billions of planets, only about four or six percent of them, those planetary systems look like ours that have terrestrial planets in the center, in or around the habitable zone, and then gaseous planets outside. Everybody else looks weird. So, how do we explain this? How do astronomers explain all of this? All of this weirdness and what seems to be the sort of minority of our own. I guess maybe that in, in that context, we're the weir weird ones. Oddly enough, the first person to posit, uh, posit a explanation on how a star is formed and how planets are formed was not an astronomer or a mathematician. It was, in fact, a philosopher by the name of Immanuel Kant. Now, I have yet to find the motivation for why he, his thoughts went in this direction, but in general, he got it right or at least to first order. What he considered was that there was this large cloud of stuff. And he knew about gravity. And he knew that if in the middle of this cloud of stuff, there was more mass, or i.e. a higher density, then that cloud is going to collapse in and upon itself. When it does so, the center of that cloud is going to heat up and become a star. And because of what is going on, or a great example of what is going on here is now at the uh, Arena Center with Disney on Ice, is you have the conservation of angular momentum. A figure skater with their arms out goes into a spin. When they bring their arms in, they spin up rather dramatically. So this cloud spins up very dramatically, and so it easily collapses along this axis, but centripetal force basically keeps it from collapsing very well into this direction which creates a disk. And from that disk, you have the planets that then form. This was, eh, this is a little bit, um, this is probably where he got a little bit wrong. He kind of thought there was a giant explosion. Really, that would be akin to maybe the star turning on, but this is what it actually looks like, or at least from an astronomer's point of view. It's much less pretty from an artistic standpoint, but hey. What you start off with is a giant molecular cloud, very much like the Orion Nebula, which I'll be showing later. In that cloud, the cloud is not, de or not homogeneously dense. There are pockets of more dense material, pockets that have more material in that localized area than anywhere else. 
And so what Einstein and Newton tell us is that given those density pockets, those mass, mass pockets, those are gonna accumulate even more matter more quickly than anywhere else. And then you find these dense cores, you refer to those as, uh, well, we refer to those as cores, those will then start collapsing in and upon itself. The cloud will fragment. If we just concentrate on one core, again, we have that the inner part of the uh, core is collapsing faster because of gravity. Gravity is a function of distance. So the faster or the, the stuff closer in is, collapse, is feeling stronger gravity, hence accelerating faster. Eventually, you're going to get a protostar that forms, and then again, that disk that surrounds it. On top of that, in nature, we find that two things are more than likely true, or if not always true. One, it's going to rotate. Any object you look at in space has some form of rotation, even if it's just minorly small. That is why all of this, all of this cloud, there is a coherent rotation there. There is a coherent rotation there, which then leads into that disk, uh, disk formation. But also, there's going to be a magnetic field because there are charged particles everywhere. And as the magnetic field collapses, it gets stronger. And so you find, uh, you create these bipolar flows or bipolar jets where things get trapped into that magnetic field slam onto the uh, pole and again just get ejected out with violent speeds out in those um, bipolar uh, flows. The material gets ejected out at relativistic speeds. This is a tremendous amount of energy in those, in those um, uh, jets. Eventually this material um, collapses basically either onto the star or onto the disk. Then you have planetary formation in the disk. This is what we call a debris disk. And then finally you have that. Here is a more scientific -y technical term. This is what we call essentially the cloud uh, fragment. You have the parent cloud, the mole uh, molecular cloud, you have the cloud core. This is what we call, and these are all YSOs or young stellar objects. This is a class zero, a class one, a class two, and a class three. What separates them is how much stuff, again, technical term, surrounds those protostars. These aren't stars yet. These are still protostars. Here, the protostar is completely enveloped within a cloud, within the molecular cloud in which it's being born, uh, kind of the amniotic sac, as you were. Now, the cloud is becoming, when that's class zero. Class one, the cloud becomes more transparent, and we're left with basically a envelope surrounding a disk, which is surrounding a uh, protostar. That envelope dissipates. We're left with class twos or classic T Tories. And then class threes are uh, weak line T Tories. This is essentially when planetary formation is finishing up. Most of the disk has been either eaten up by planets or planetesimals or has been blown out of the system by the star itself. So how do we know that? How do we have any idea that that's true? Well, we have some observational evidence for it. Back in the 90s, we started getting images from uh, the PRISM, uh, oh, excuse me, the ESO Visions mission and from Hubble. What you can see here is that when we look in a star forming region or suspected star forming region like Orion, we see these areas that have these dark sort of patches the reason why that those are dark is because the dust is literally blocking the light coming in from behind it or within it. There is material inside that dust that is bright, but because we're looking at it, because that dust is so dense um, or opaque, we can't see anything in it. And eventually, these things pop out. When the dust becomes transparent enough, we start seeing these bright points that are enshrouded in dust and gas. Kind of like this, but still, eh, maybe, maybe not, who knows. Then Hubble came along, and now we're definitely seeing, well, now with strong, much stronger evidence that we're seeing class twos. What we're seeing here, particularly with this one, or this one, 
is that you have the protostar in here, and this black, uh, black bar is dust. That is your protoplanetary disk. That is where the new Earths are coming from, is in there. And so that would be this, this, well, I, kind of more like that, one of these two, uh, looked edge on. So you're looking into the disk itself. Because the protostar is very luminous. It's actually more luminous than the sun. So catching this thing, being able to see something that is maybe hundreds of Kelvin next to something that is thousands of Kelvin is very challenging from a light uh, contrast perspective. It's just the disk is typically too dim for us to see. We can only really see it at this point when it is projected against the light. Here are the evidence of those, uh, those jets that I was talking about. Here again, you have the YSO, that's the, the disk, and then perpendicular to it is that red line is high energy photons coming out from both sides. This is a similar uh, picture, but zoomed out. And then this is a, another picture of another high mass young stellar object uh, where this is the same scale. So here represents this. You can see this is a lot of energy being thrown out of these stars, being thrown out of these environments, slamming into very cold gas and creating these, these lobes that are very, very um, bright in the infrared and particularly in the radio. So here we have JWST comes on, onto the scene. JWST, this is the Orion Nebula. Hopefully everyone knows that. You have the trapezium in here. It's my favorite uh, object in the night sky. It's naked eye. It's a, an object you can see as a fuzzy blob in the uh, naked night sky. And it is this closest star forming region to us. Given, easily given the light travel time, when I look at this object, I always think to myself, I am looking at stars being born. I can't exactly see them with my eye. But a photon coming off one of these uh, young stars is streaming through space and hitting my eye. So it's only a few hundred, I should know the distance of this, but a few hundred light years away. Um, so even like I said, uh, it takes millions of years for stars to form. So even given that light, 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 light travel time, it's, yeah, you're looking at stars actually being born. Now, what can JWST do? Why is JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, why is it so exciting, particularly in this field of study? Well, JWST is called the successor to Hubble. Uh, I nitpick, I have a nitpick with that. Because Hubble looked mostly in the optical. It looked mostly in what we can see with our human eye. Now, there was a telescope that was similar to it called Spitzer that looked in the infrared or the heat part of the spectrum. JWST is really the successor to Spitzer. Because JWST, while it can look in the optical, it's designed to look in the infrared. Because in the infrared, that dust is a little bit more transparent. And so we can really see into the inner portions of these star forming regions because that's one of the primary mandates for the telescope's existence is to find exoplanets to help us understand how these planets form and in doing so we can understand in in order to do that we need to understand how these early systems evolved the other is to find dark energy and you know age of the universe and stuff like that unimportant stuff like that oh this is to show you just exactly you know how much competition we're giving JWST here at uh, our telescope. This is one of our earliest um, student uh, images that we've taken. Again, this is trapezium. So yes, so we're, we're just this close <laughs> to the kind of resolution and, and beauty that JWST gives us. What I wanna do is I wanna turn your attention to this though. This is called the Orion bar or here, the Orion bar. This is a linear type feature which is basically the edge of one of the emission nebulas or emission regions. The reason why this exists 
is because of light from this star smacking into light coming up from the trapezium. And so those two, that, those two sources of energy are causing pressure and creating this linear feature. They're, it's literally pushing the dust into this feature. It's enhancing the density of that region. So this is a really good place to look if you're interested in trying to find a star that is in the process of forming, which we have. And this image is, is to me, very, very sexy. I would, if we were in a magazine, it would be the centerfold. So here, obviously, we have a star that's born. That is a star that has been born. It is an O star, B star, somewhere in there. It is very hot, very bright, causing all of this to happen. Over here, you remember those class ones where you had a disk star in, uh, enshrouded in, or really a class zero, enshrouded in, a, in an envelope where you really couldn't see what was going on? That would be this. And then this one is really the thing that I love. Here we are seeing a, we have an actual image of a class two. Now, half of my thesis was done on looking at thousands of stars, or rather hundreds of stars, 1700 to be specific, uh, 1700 stars in another uh, molecular cloud called Rotofeucus. I looked at these as data points on a chart. I looked at the light, how the light changed over time. So a lot of data on tables. That's how I got to see class two YSOs. Now, people actually get to see them, how they're forming. You actually get to see just how chaotic I've always known these objects to be. How the physical processes that are going on in here are not simple by any stretch of the imagination. Those pictures that I showed you are vast simplifications of just the wonderful physics that is going on and forming stars and planets like this one. And then here you have filaments. Um, these again, this I kind of went in backwards order. So this would be the first part of it. These filaments indicate these denser regions. Then you go over here to you know class zero, uh, class zero, class one. This would be class two, and then this would be finally a star. So we're seeing evidence in one image, just one image, of essentially the entire process of planetary formation, of stellar formation and planetary formation, which is unbelievable. Again, just wanted to highlight this. There's a disk, the star is embedded in it, and this is the cocoon. This is probably being, this is not the jet per se, but this gas is probably being affected by the jet, hence why it is more linear than the top of the, uh, the cocoon at the top. But this is more recent, but we do actually have images of type twos in a way. We have these. Who are, how many of you are familiar with the supernova acid black hole image of M87, that red donut-y thing? That image was taken using a process called radio interferometry, which allows the use of multi combining multiple telescopes to gain the angular resolution of a much larger one. In that case, that telescope was as large as the Earth. In this case, this is used by the ALMA array, which is in the Amacama Desert in Chile, on the top of the Andes, and it's roughly, 20 kilometers in size. Um, so here, we can, they can't image black holes at, in other galaxies. But what they can do is they can image those stars that we suspected, that I, I looked at. I looked at the variability, and I was like, oh yeah, that's, that's definitely, definitely a YSO misbehaving. Now they look, went back and looked at them, and now we get to the point where we can see we're not seeing the protostar per se, but we're definitely seeing this disk. And we're seeing these channels. Again, we're not looking at the exoplanets themselves, but we're looking at their, we're looking at evidence of their existence. These are these paths being swept out by these planets as they're being formed. Again, 
the resolution of this telescope is not precise, is not large enough, and its sensitivity is not large enough to pick up the tiny point of light that would be the planet, but it can pick up the paths of where these uh, planets are literally plowing out the material. This one over here is a little bit even provocative in that you can kind of see something of a spiral structure there. And also this one as well, which I'll get to and uh, why that's provocative in a moment. Now, I started this talk, kind of, sort of, talking about how planets formed. Well, the reason why we thought that we were, why we were really, really certain, given our data point of one, as a uh, word of caution, if you're uh, a uh, aspiring a scientist, you got a data point of one, really don't be confident about anything. The reason why we were somewhat confident is because of this idea, is that you have this disk, and we have observations of YSOs that support this as well, that the disk has a temperature profile, as one would expect. The closer you are to the star, the hotter it is. <laughs> the further away you are from the star, the colder it is. What that means is that only certain elements or certain materials can exist because of that heat. In here, really all you're having is silicates, irons, and uh, metals. It's the only material that can really exist in this, in this case. There is hydrogen and helium gas, but in terms of solid material, iron, nickel, uh, sand, that's basically it. Once you get out here, you get to a point where the disk cools enough that water vapor can turn into ice. And that is known as the ice line or the snow line, depending on who you ask. And then as you get further out, you can have methane ice. So the idea is, given our understanding of how Jupiter formed, or how the outer planets formed, you need this icy material as a starting, uh, starting block. And you also need it to be fairly cold. Because again, in this interior region, as I was talking about with a 51 peg, it's so hot we would expect any hydrogen helium gas of any significance to be blown out, to be destroyed. So you need a relatively calm environment in order for those planets to form. Uranus and Neptune, the reason why they are blue, methane, methane ice in the upper atmospheres. So everything seems to be uh, consistent. So what about those 51 peg planets? What about those planets that have inclinations that are so far off everybody else's inclination? Why do we have the weird planets. Well, we have two processes that can happen that fall into the category of planetary migration. The first one is, and this would explain hot Jupiters, is that as the, uh, as the planets form, as I showed in, uh, in here, planets are forming in a thick disk. And they're plowing through, they're plowing through that material in order to form. Well, that's going to cause some friction. That's going to cause drag, specifically. And depending on how quickly this disk dissipates, hard thing to say, if it doesn't dissipate quickly, then it's going to experience a lot of drag. And it's going to spiral inward to the point that you can eventually get a stable orbit so close to this host star. We've even seen evidence that suggests that this process doesn't uh, stop so amicably. Stars eat planets. Some of the planets never could get to a stable orbit. They just fell into the star and got eaten. The reason why we know this, or the evidence that we know, is that the star's metallicity is a little higher than one would expect in that environment. Those metals came from the planet that it ate, or planets. What about the other planets that have weird inclinations that are like have cometary inclinations? Well, that comes from what we call planet 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 scattering. This is an idea of what would happen in the solar system if, say, uh, a star flew by fairly close. But it's kind of a similar principle in that what would happen is think of these as uh, well think of these as planetesimals that are forming in that disk. Some are going to be larger than others. Some of them are actually going to be uh, planet-sized. And they're going to literally throw their weight around. 
and they're going to cause planets to get, move in various different ways. They're going to cause them to be per, uh, perturbed, and it's going to cause their orbits to be chaotic in that the orbits are not going to be nice uh, circles. The orbits are not going to lie in a nice plane where they started. They're going to be all over the place. And again, perhaps even more provocatively, we have had observations from microlensing events of rogue planets, planets that are not orbiting anything. These are planets moving through the galaxy with attached to no one. We believe that those were created by these perturbations. Jupiter went by a planet, and or Jupiter-sized uh, world went by a, like a Mars-sized world and said, just get out of here. Just threw it out of the solar system. And it is now flying away. Reminds me of an old uh, original Star Trek episode. Um, what's even weirder about this is that, or again, weird to me, is that from dynamical simulations of when we incorporate these two mechanisms into our previous theory, which was called the Nice theory, although it's spelled nice, it's from France, um, into the Nice theory, we expect this to happen a lot. We, in fact, expect most planets in the universe, or at least the galaxy, are rogue. That there are more planets that do not orbit anything than there are planets that do orbit something. And so, yeah, that's that's all I got for you. Um, I think that answers everything. Thank you. Hopefully, I didn't run completely out of time. Yeah. So, what kind of uh, questions do we have for Rob? You got the. You know, oh yeah, I've got the mic. Anyone have any questions? Yeah. 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 So, why are Jupiter mass? Binary objects such as surprise. Jupiter mass binary? In other words, JWST looked at the Orion Nebula mm -hmm. and they find these pairs of objects, neither of which is large enough to be a star. And they're calling them jumbo, Jupiter mass binary objects. Uh, and so it's claimed, you know, oh, astronomers are all in a tizzy now because they can't <laughs> explain it. Now I was wondering if a planet, a uh, star, development expert could perhaps uh, give some insight into that. So, um, yeah, science communication really likes to say, oh, no, we, we have no idea what's going on. Um, that is a very, very important discovery because of something called, no or because of nomenclature, really. Uh, and I know that some of my colleagues get on me for being a little bit too pedantic about this, but I think actually the name of something should actually fall into the physical mechanism by it formed, which is why I have such a problem with Pluto's definition. The third definition is not intrinsic to Pluto. So what I mean by uh, what I mean by nomenclature is that you have three objects. You have planets like Jupiter. You have brown dwarfs, which are stars or that are giant clouds of gas, hydrogen, helium that are either bright because they are gravitationally contracting or they can be burning hydrogen into deuterium. There might be a little bit of nuclear fusion going on. Then you have stars. That is a function of mass. At this point, the, our definitions are that stars, or that, excuse me, that planets end at 13 times the mass of Jupiter. At that point, theoretically, you can burn hydrogen to deuterium. A friend of mine did his graduate thesis on the end of that. The transition between brown dwarf and uh, star is roughly around 8%, this, uh, the mass of the sun. That's when hydrogen turns into helium. So to get to your question, one of the, thing, one of the things is, are Jupiter's failed stars? Or are they actually, in my opinion, planets? Because where did they form? Did the Jupiter or did the object form around the star in a disk? Or if we go, uh, if you were to look back, you saw that giant core, a uh, giant cloud and those cores, and those will fragment. You can also have small cores fragment. That's where binaries come from. You can have two binary stars. So from my money, my intuition tells me what they're looking at is in fact brown dwarfs, not Jupiter's. 
because, and they are formed in the same way that binary stars form, is that you had gravitational collapse of a uh, core that fragmented to very, very small ma low mass objects that then formed into brown dwarfs. So, or whatever mass they happen to be at. So, yeah. So through your, your planetary formation model, could one of those giants accumulate enough mass to become uh, a second Earth star? Oh. oh, so the, the question is, could, say, a Jupiter that was forming hypothetically accrete enough mass onto it, get big enough to turn into a brown dwarf or a star itself? A star itself, I would think, is impossible at that point, because the, that would be so much mass that would affect the previous evolution. So it wouldn't have gotten into a star and disk. There's just not enough material in the disk itself for another star to form. Because the disk is roughly 10% of the total mass of the other star. Now, could it form a brown dwarf? Maybe. That's been hypothesized. That it could, if basically almost all of the mass fell into one of those, then theoretically, yes. So, kind of connected. You were talking about how there was one area in the uh, new star formation field that appeared to be compressed to that line. Mm -hmm. What is the theory on the effect of that matter compression on planetary formation? Could it do something like this? Is it something else? It's an excellent question. So what it can do, or what it is doing, is it has, a, it has implications to stellar formation in it's enhancing the amount of stellar formation in that region. However, in terms of even more local formation, probably not. It's probably not having anything to say as to the mass distributions of the disks or the types of planets that form in those disks. It's just saying that in that particular region, you're more likely going to find a star forming with a planet than in any other region of the. And if those stars had not been there, that uh, that planetary formation probably wouldn't have happened to begin with, at, or at all. So. Any other question? Yeah. yeah. Remind us of the time scale associated. Thank you. Uh, I meant to do that. So, mass. It's always a story about mass. Uh, the higher the mass, the faster things move. Um, because everything, energy generation, which is what dictates evolution, is very, very dependent on how much mass you have to burn. Time scale wise, star formation is a very small fraction of the evolution of the rest of the stars. If we just concentrate on the sun, for example, the sun has an a life, uh, adult life, or has a lifespan where it burns hydrogen and helium that lasts about 10 billion years. Its formation probably only took 15 million years. Its death probably will take on the order of maybe 100 million years. So the beginnings of a star and the endings of a star go by very quickly. Most of its life is spent as the sun is now. So, but we do believe that solar type planets have to form in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 million years based on observations of these objects with and without disks. Or material form. So, yeah. So, the question is um, do I have an opinion on how big a star can be and still be a star? Um, yes. The, for me, there are two competing issues with this. If we just simply look at uh, just the star itself, because of that conservation of angular momentum business, as the mass falls, if you have more mass and it's falling to a similar distance, it's going to speed up even more. High mass stars are very, very rapidly rotating. So you get to a point where if you increase the mass, you're, well, you increase the mass, you increase the rate of rotation of the planet. 
you get to something called the Eddington limit. Effectively, what that means is that the centrifugal force, if you'll permit me, pushing the material outward exceeds the gravitational pressure inward. And so the literally, uh, literally the star spins itself to death. It just doesn't form, it just spins out and mass gets distributed uh, out into space. Whether a smaller star forms as after that, probably, but there is definitely a, an upper limit there. The other issue is how does that kind of mass survive fragmentation? The popular answer is uh, around 150 solar masses. Uh, the pistol star, I think, is, is an example of that. So we basically say that around 150 solar masses or 150 times the mass of the sun, the star is going to be spinning too much that it's going to blow or spin itself to pieces. But my question is, if you have a core that is of that mass, will it survive as a single fragment? Or will its rotation actually fragment it into smaller objects? So for example, Eta Carina, there's some debate as to is it a single star or is it actually a binary, two massive star binaries? So in that sense, I, the mass limit would be lower because it would never reach the Eddington limit. The, it would fragment too much and lose too much mass in that process. So uh, what the actual limit is, I'm not entirely certain. But I can tell you 150 roughly is the absolute max. Anybody online? I think David Worth, you had a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. I was wondering from earlier in your presentation about star formation and planet formation and everything, how the Oort cloud fits into the model and why does it remain globular while all the other matter seems to have flattened into a disk? Excellent. So um, when I talk to science skeptics, one of the things they don't like is the Oort cloud. And I, I get it. I get it. We've never seen the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud is theoretically composed of cometary bodies that are spherically distributed beyond the Kuiper belt. So we're talking hundreds of thousands of AU away. We have trouble finding asteroids that are basically the tip of the Earth's nose. So trying to find something that is only slightly brighter than that hundreds of thousands of AU away is very, very difficult. Reason why we suspect that it's there is we, it, we see sort of a complementary effect in the galaxy. When you look at galaxies, the first things to form were the globular clusters, and then everything kind of fell in under that. So the idea here is that as the cloud was collapsing down and increasingly spinning, Again, that cloud, that oversimplified view of a really dense core and a less dense outside is too simple. The less dense outside also had little bits of, of density irregularities, little denser parts. And we suspect that the cometary objects formed from those denser parts as the entire cloud was collapsing. And they just kind of, because of their orbits, just kind of stu or st uh, stayed out at those large, um, large distances and had very chaotic orbits in the sense that since they formed in a spherical distribution, they stayed in a spherical distribution. That answers your question. Thank you, that's very helpful. I think there was a question. Um, I'm familiar with the relativistic jet in one of the galaxies. I thought, only a black hole could have so much gravity because that you mentioned that uh, it happens at mm -hmm. solar level. Mm -hmm. um, so that's pretty frequent. It's almost at this point, it's kind of ubiquitous. If you have a disk of any sort, you're more than likely going to have a jet that um, pushes material to relativistic speeds. How relativistic? That depends on what you're talking about because you can have, in this case, it's relativistic, but fairly low fraction. I honestly don't know the particular fraction. But if you looked at something like an X-ray binary, which is can be caused by a black accretion disk around a black hole or an accretion disk around a neutron star, um, 
you can have, it would be even more relativistic. And then obviously if you have a black hole or supermassive black hole, then it's massive, um, very, very hot. So. Oh, sorry. So uh, the question was, um, he was, uh, ha oh, had the yeah. expectation? Hmm? Yeah, he had the expectation that you would need a very dense mass, very localized mass like a black hole in order to form relativistic jets. And in fact, you don't. You, you can do it around stars. real talk. Uh, 